Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure you're delighted to rush back from your lunch for a discussion with the housing ombudsman, um, but I will try and uh, get to the point. So my name is Alan Park. I uh, lead what's called our systemic and uh, compliance team within the housing ombudsman. And what we do, for those of you that don't know the housing ombudsman, is that we uh, receive complaints uh, from tenants in the social housing sector uh, and we work with landlords to either put those right or we can adjudicate against them and make findings against landlords. But recently what we've tried to do is to try and share the themes of those complaints. We believe that complaints are that canary in the coal mine. They can tell you when something is going wrong. If 100 people are saying something's going wrong, there's probably something going on there and you need to do something about it. So my team looks at themes and trends that come out of the complaints, but we also look at the learning from the complaints. What recommendations can we make? Uh, and the other thing we look at is we have a complaint handling code that we expect landlords to adhere to, and we look at compliance with that. And that's all part of our systemic uh, and thematic investigations. So one of the product that comes out of that is what's called a spotlight investigation and this is where we're really looking at the learning from complaints and we've previously issued investigation reports into cladding and into uh, heating and hot water and the reason I'm standing here today is because uh, as we said about a year ago we issued a report on damp and mold. Now it's important to say that spotlight report is not about blame. And it's not about us saying to landlords, here's what, all the things that you've done wrong. Because what we look to do is work collaboratively with both tenants, uh, with landlords, and with people in the sector to look at what are the issues driving complaints. Uh, and then what recommendations can come from that? How can we make things better? And if you're sat here today, we found out about some amazing products this morning, and I was sat there thinking, you know, how is what I'm going to talk about relevant to this, to some of this audience? Well, actually, if you're working with a social landlord who's saying, I've got this constant problem with damp and mold, you know, all of these innovations, all of these things that you're talking about, your members are talking about, are relevant to how, you know, there is now a report out there that you can take to a social landlord and say, well, look, this is what the housing ombudsman expects of you, and we think we can solve your problem. Um, so we use the intelligence from our casework. What we also do with the Spotlight investigation is we talk to the sector. We issue calls for evidence. Uh, we listen to everybody, so sector experts, landlords, residents, to make those recommendations. And then finally, we don't stop there. We monitor what's happened since the report. And I'm going to come on to what we've seen since we issued the damp and mould report. So why did we talk, why did we choose damp and mould? Well, ITV would like to say that it was because of them, uh, but actually we started work in early 2021 on looking at whether or not the data and the evidence supported the, you know, what was out there, that there was a problem in social housing with damp and mould. Our casework data showed that, you know, over 1,500 complaints that come into our dispute support team, we'd investigate 410 of them and, and found maladministration in the majority. And we were ordering recommendations and compensation. You can see there, you know, £125,000 worth of compensation over 142 landlords. So we saw that there was probably a problem, but that wasn't, that's not, that's only one body of evidence. So. We went to the English Housing Survey from 2019-20, and that confirmed what our casework was telling us, and actually showed that, you know, in a lot of social sector homes, you know, 3%, 133,000 homes were saying that there was problems in at least one room. 5% of social housing, that's 192,000 homes, lacked thermal comfort. And actually, what the Housing Survey told us was that the private rented sector was worse with 1.1 million homes categorized as non-decent for damp and mold. So the warning signs were all there. But the other thing we look at at the Housing Ombudsman is the impact of this. What does this mean for tenants? Because it's very easy to dismiss damp and mold, and that's the theme of the report, is that it's very easy to say, and we've heard a bit of it this morning, you know, don't put your wet laundry on a radiator, make sure you open that window. But actually, 
when we spoke to tenants, we found quite a profound impact. It was causing distress, distress, disruption, embarrassment, physical and mental health problems. And this was all set across a pandemic where we all spent a lot more time in our homes than we planned to. But we do recognize that it's complicated. We do recognize that this is set against structural and occupancy factors, overcrowding, fuel poverty, the drive towards net zero, the age and designs of homes. So we know that homes built between 1981 and 19, in 1990 are probably going to fail this decent home standard around damp and mould. So we know it's complicated and that there are multiple factors. So that's why we spoke to the sector as well. And we carried out our research. We did a call for evidence between April and June. We got over 500 responses. Um, we had discussions with landlords, representative bodies, to try and build up a picture. We spoke to the National Federation of Arms Length Management Organizations, Chartered Institute of Public Health, National Housing Federation, the Tenant Participation Advisory Service. We wanted to hear everyone's voice. And as you'll hear, we want to keep hearing your voice. So what did we find? Because that's why I'm talking about it. We found, you know, a culture within social housing of reactive as opposed to proactive approach to damp and mould. We saw too often it was about waiting for the phone to ring from a tenant to say, there's a problem, I've got mould here, I've got this here, as opposed to using the time and the resources available to the landlord to preempt these problems. So actually, the void periods between rents or you know, taking assessment of your housing stock, where are there likely to be problems? What does this type of building normally, what are the kind of problems? So we wanted to see a more proactive approach to damp and mold rather than waiting for the complaint to come in, waiting uh, for the phone to ring. We found a culture of inferring blame on the tenant. Um, and the default reaction of most social landlords is to say, have you tried opening a window? Or have you tried you know, not putting your damp clothes on a radiator in the middle of December? Well, most of us do that. Um, so, and obviously, within that, there's an education of tenants. There's an education, please don't, you know, I was hearing a tale of somebody who'd put sellotape in front of a vent. Uh, don't do that, you know. So this education of tenants, not inferring blame, but taking responsibility both for your property and for your tenant and making sure they've got every, everything in their ability to be able to manage the problem. We saw an approach that was very resident focused. What has the resident done to this? The, what's the problem, the resident? as opposed to being fabric focused. What about the building? What is the building telling us? And ultimately this fatalistic attitude that ultimately damp and mold is just damp and mold and everybody gets it. And actually, if you just open a window, it'll all go away. And what we encourage from the report is actually a zero tolerance approach to damp and mold, that it's absolutely unacceptable for somebody to live with damp and mold in their household. And that's the the, that should be the default position of landlords and people within the sector, as opposed to accepting that, you know, actually a bit of damper mould is just par for the course. And um, it was, is going to require a massive culture change within the social housing sector. Uh, and one of the residents we spoke to where the quote chimed with us was at the moment, the culture within the, the sector is a culture of not caring. Um, Residents used words such as it was being tiring, it was time consuming. They found that they were constantly meeting a hostile attitude and a feeling that landlords just don't care. And from talking to people in the room today, what's really evident is so many of these problems are very easily solved if you have that proactive approach from a landlord rather than a reactive approach. It can sometimes be cheaper, less time consuming than waiting for the problem to develop. So we made some key recommendations, and there's lots up on that screen, but I'll whiz through them. There's a very snappy phrase there that says, find your silence. Um, what that meant was, obviously, lots of people speak up about damp and mould. They speak up about the problems they're facing, but the majority don't. We're a very polite British culture, and we don't like to complain. Uh, so actually, who's not complaining? Who are you not hearing from as a social landlord? Because that can sometimes tell you that there's a problem there. So 
we often get organizations coming to us going, oh, how can I get down the number of complaints I'm receiving? And actually what we say is, we really like high levels of complaints. Because high levels of complaints show that your tenants feel that they can talk to you. They feel they can raise problems with you. We get more worried about the organizations that say, oh, nobody, nobody complains about our service. Because that tells us that probably they're not getting through. Um, so we want a proactive communication strategy with tenants both about how they can manage damp and mold in their homes, but also actually how they can raise the issues, how they can resolve them. Um, we think all landlords should have a damp and mold strategy, a framework with which they're going to assess damp and mold in their properties. You know, are they going to go in between, in, you know, use the void periods, the mutual exchanges to actually go in and preempt all of these problems? Simple things. It sounds really daft to have a box up there that says treat people fairly. But unfortunately, the evidence showed that too often we saw that that just wasn't, the, wasn't happening. It's not the tenant's fault that they live in a building that's been marked for regeneration or disposal. And so we wanted everybody to have the same rights, the same, you know, that zero tolerance attitude towards damp and mold. Staff to feel empowered um, you know, so actually that they could do something about it, that they weren't just given a five-minute period to go around, stick a meter in the wall, and actually, we talked about this morning, not diagnosing the problem, you know, using people with the right skills to be able to address the problem, which is where a lot of you come in. So not looking at this kind of quick fix, but what's the right fix for the problem, using appropriate skill contractors, and looking at those net zero plans and whether actually there's that inadvertent consequence of what you're doing when you're shoving the insulation in or whatever like that, that actually suddenly that's led to another problem. So taking an all-round view of what you're doing to the fabric of the building. We recommended very mundane things like really good record keeping. But if actually a tenant is only there for six months and then another tenant comes in and you lose that intelligence, you lose what that tenant has said to you through poor record keeping, how can you possibly diagnose what's going on in the building if you're losing that, that record keeping and what's going on? So we wanted people to really do the boring well, which is what is the, what is the history of this building and what is the history of someone living in this building and the problems they've encountered? Um, we want to keep, we want, as I say, keep residents updated about what you're doing. If there is a problem, you know, we said earlier that maybe it's not solvable in two weeks. Maybe it does take a year to solve. But what are you doing? What, what, you know, what actually is going to be the process to try and sort this out? And using the complaints process to identify these areas, to actually be that early warning sign of damp and mold. Knowing your stock, knowing your housing stock, what are the common problems, what are the common factors, the age, the design, the modifications. You know, we know that certain types of properties have certain types of issues, but there's a real, as I've said, reactive attitude towards that as, as opposed to proactive. And know your residents, know the occupancy factors, know what overcrowding looks like, so that when you get a family arrive and previously there was, you know, a single lady living there and now there's six people, what is actually going to be the consequence of that overcrowding or those new people in? Lots of recommendations. We also had recommendations for the governance of social landlords. So, you know, for people are actually further up the food chain looking down and going, okay, what, what is my organization doing about damp and mold? Are we on the front foot? Are we being proactive? How are we looking at these complex cases? Are you aware of the complex cases? And have we got that level of learning culture within the organization rather than a blame culture towards our tenants? Um, in terms of how it's been responded to, so we issued the report a year ago and we've seen a number of really positive reactions since we issued the report. We found good practice like surveyors now being equipped with thermal cameras and equipment in complex cases. So they can actually spot where the issues is and properly diagnose. Um, we've seen void teams going in in between lets with specialist damp contractors to look at what they can do when the building is empty before another person comes in and has the same problems. Um, people looking at how to predict mold growth in people's homes, humidity, temperature sensors, all these things that I'm sure you're very familiar with that seem real common sense but weren't happening 
before. One landlord has in introduced a resident app solely for damp and mould reporting and advice so they can collate the data, they can collate videos and pictures, and they can accurately come up with a strategy to address it. Um, and we've seen um, that, you know, we've seen things being recorded on dashboards, risk assessments, so loads of really good practice out there from landlords. And that's, it's important to recognise that because obviously the report can seem quite negative as well. What we want to do next is we want to keep hearing about the good practice. I've been chatting to a few people today saying, oh, we're doing this with a social landlord, or we're doing that. And we are looking at a follow-up report um, saying, look, this is what we said, but actually this is what has happened since, and this is where we think we need to go next. We're keen to keep the conversation going so that we can really promote that zero-tolerance attitude towards damp and mould. Um, and that has been a whistle-stop tour. <laughs> Very quick. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, rather than a question, I'll make a statement. Since Jade's in the room somewhere, I know, um, she's probably got the fingers, fingers to hand, but we have seen a very sizable increase in inquiries for training for housing, housing associations and social housing providers on dampness in the last few months, um, or over the globe the last 12 months, um, to a point where we can no longer accommodate any more clients this year. Um, so we're now looking at bookings for 2023, and that's just that's even for the online stuff. So your audience appear to be taking your message seriously and actually skilling up in all sorts of ways. So it's good, it's good, good for us, but good for good for tenants as well, I'm sure. Excellent. Questions? Anybody got a question? Yes, sir. I know, pardon, yeah. Just in a wider area, um, leaseholders um, uh, as a, are, are having similar sort of issues and um, a, a sort of a poverty trap, if you want to call it that, within um, leasehold buildings, even where they're self-managed. I don't know if anyone... I, 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 I think you're right. Um, it's not my area of expertise, um, but, yeah, you know, we, we, we are aware of all sorts of issues, particularly with things like the, 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 the cladding, um, cladding problems where, you know, government has to bring in um, legislation and bring in interventions to allow leaseholders to get really important work done. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure that there are lots of incidences where, um, you know, leaseholders are being absolutely crucified by, by the cost of retro, re, re, remediation, and it just not, isn't getting done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Behind you, see. Thank you. Can I just uh, give you a, a ringing endorsement? I thought that was an absolutely splendid talk, and it seems to me to encapsulate what we have in our business as um, a strap line, which is technical competence with emotional intelligence, because it's not just about the fabric, it's about the people. And you really have seemed to have really gripped it. And I've thought and long hard about these issues for so long now. So it's really encouraging. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, you'll get your £10 later. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, did, I think Greg's... Whichever, whichever. Peter, Greg, either. OK, thanks. Pete Bannister, Holland Rostron. Uh, thanks, Alan. Interesting. I'll, I will look up your report on damp and mould, I promise. And, uh, but I, you mentioned a st statistic, uh, a couple of slides from the start, in which, uh, if you average your figures, um, uh, compensation claims average at less than £1,000 per landlord found at fault by an investigation. And I'm just wondering what the basis for compensation might be. Matter of curiosity, really. Yeah, no, it, it's, 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 it's a very live topic of debate because actually we've just been told by... <laughs> our department that we, we are probably recommending compensation too low um, and we, are, we have what's called our guidance on remedies which is the kind of amounts that we recommend for various things going wrong and it's a framework. It hasn't been reviewed in a long time and one of the things you know, we're learning from this report as well and one of the things that's come out of it is actually do we need to look at higher levels of compensation. Compen we, we would always link compensation to the impact on someone, what has been the impact of what's gone wrong, uh, and there is a very live project at the moment looking at that because um, I think it's a valid observation. Sure, it just 
uh, interestingly, even on a small dwelling, if you do a reasonably competent investigation of that dwelling for damp, it's going to cost the best part of a thousand pounds in my experience. So um, it may help landlords nudge them in the right direction of spending the money in the right areas in the first instance. Yeah, what, I mean, what I would do is clarify. So the compensation is the extra amount to recognise the distress. There will be a separate remedy, carry out a survey, put this right, that's not part of that £125,000 figure. So there is things that we can recommend to make sure it doesn't happen again, the survey, the work, but then we make re remedy recommendations on actually this person has lived with this for two years, so pay them £2,000 or whatever it might be. So that, that figure is not linked to the work to actually rectify the issue. That's linked to the distress as a result of living with it. Um, can I just follow up on that? Being slightly cynical, isn't it cheaper for the housing associations to keep on paying compensation um, rather than spending the millions potentially to put their whole housing stock into a condition where they won't get these complaints. It's a bit like the water boards and sewage being pumped out. It's cheaper than to pay the fines and sort out the infrastructure. I, I, I think it's a, it's a valid point, and it's why we know that there's a culture change needed, and we know that we need to actually take the conversation forward and make it so that it's actually just unacceptable to have an attitude like that. I was very fortunate to be at an event yesterday um, and one of the presenters at the event was Ed Daffan, who's a survivor of the Grenfell tragedy. And he talked in very similar terms about this culture change where it shouldn't be acceptable to ignore a complaint that can result in something like Grenfell, but that is ultimately what happened. Um, and so we need to change the whole culture and thinking around complaints in social housing, how the level of readiness of social housing, so that actually the landlords that think like that are in the vast minority rather than it being the norm. Well, that's only done legislation. Uh, so you're, you're absolutely right. So the social housing white paper should become an act soon. There's been a couple of changes of government, so it keeps getting delayed. Um, but there's a social housing white paper coming that gives us more teeth. It gives the social housing regulator more teeth. Um, so there is now the political will behind this to try and address some of these systemic issues. And that's why the Housing Ombudsman now has a systemic team leading on these issues as well. They, you could also add to that that <clears throat> the legislation changed a couple of years ago that saw tenants um, gain the right to stop paying rent if they're living in poor accommodation has changed the, the, the situation with disrepair claims enormously. And I, you know, just as a straw poll, how many people in this room are involved in disrepair claims at one point or another as a contractor trying to sort out the mess or trying to provide information to, to tenants about what's wrong with the building? Um, you can show your hands if you like, but I know, uh, because I know you, that a lot of people are involved in that process now. It seems a shame to me that there's value attached to our skills when we're trying to untangle really difficult disputes and people are willing to pay for that level of, of, of expertise at the point of dispute. But actually where they should be spending the money is to actually right at the beginning of the process where the inquiry comes in so we can sort it before it comes to dispute. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just raise one quick point? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, no, so the, the, just, uh, the gentleman here was making the point that the consequence of damp and mould can lead to, is it dust mites that leads to asthma, and absolutely, and that's why we talk in the report and we constantly talk about the impact and how the tenant's voice sometimes gets lost in this, because, yeah, so you do have families living in overcrowded conditions with children with asthma who are supposed to be in school, but there are, you know, there are a whole, we hear these stories every day in our casework, you know, of and what we're trying to constantly change the conversation around is there's a real culture in complaints of looking at what happened as opposed to the impact of what happened. But if you focus on the impact of what went wrong, that's how you actually get a good complaint handling culture going.
Thank you very much indeed. I've got to dash off, but if anyone does want to send us any examples of good practice and things like that, I'm sure there's a contact detail thing going out or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I'm not running away from you, I promise. But thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.